Hi, Grandma here, and I'm reading To Kill a Mockingbird, Chapter 27. Things did settle down after a fashion, as Atticus said they would. By the middle of October, only two small things out of the ordinary happened to two make -em citizens. No, there were three things, and they did not directly concern us, the Finches, but in a way they did. The first thing was that Bob, Mr. Bob Ewell acquired and lost a job in a matter of days and probably made himself unique in the annals of the mid-30s. He was the only man I ever heard of who was fired from the WPA for laziness. I suppose his brief burst of fame brought on a briefer burst of industry, but his job lasted only as long as his notoriety. Mr. Ewell found himself as forgotten as Tom Robinson. Thereafter, he resumed his regular weekly appearances at the welfare office for his check and received it with no grace amid obscure mutterings that the bastards who thought they ran this town wouldn't permit an honest man to make a living. Ruth Jones, the welfare leader, said Mr. Ewell openly accused Atticus of getting his job. She was upset enough to walk down to Atticus's office and tell him about it. Atticus told Miss Ruth not to fret that if Bob Ewell wanted to discuss Atticus getting his job, he knew the way to the office. The second thing happened to Judge Taylor. Judge Taylor was not a Sunday night churchgoer. Mrs. Taylor was. Judge Taylor savored his Sunday night hour alone in his big house and church time found him holed up in his study reading the writings of Bob Taylor, no kin, but the judge would have been proud to claim him. One Sunday night, lost in fruity metaphors and florid diction, Judge Taylor's attention was wrenched from the page by an irritating, scratching noise. Hush, he said to Ann Taylor, his fat, nondescript dog. Then he realized he was speaking to an empty room. The scratching noise was coming from the rear of the house. Judge Taylor clumped to the back porch to let Anne out and found the screen door swinging open. A shadow on the corner of the house caught his eye and that was all he saw of his visitor. Mrs. Taylor came home from church to find her husband in his chair, lost in the writings of Bob Taylor, with a shotgun across his lap. The third thing happened to Helen Robinson, Tom's widow. If Mr. Ewell was forgotten as Tom Robinson, Tom Robinson was forgotten as Boo Radley. But Tom Robinson was not forgotten by his employer, Mr. Link Dees. But Mr. Link Dees made a job for Helen. He didn't really need her, but he said he felt right bad about the way things turned out. I never knew who took care of her children while Helen was away. Calpurnia said it was hard on Helen because she had to walk nearly a mile out of her way to avoid the Ewells, who, according to Helen, chunked at her the first time she tried to use the public road. Mr. Link Dees eventually received the impression that Helen was coming to work each morning from the wrong direction and dragged the reason out of her. Just let it be, Mr. Link, please, sir, Helen begged. The hell I will, said Mr. Link. He told her to come by his store that afternoon before she left. She did, and Mr. Link closed his door, put his hat firmly on his head, and walked Helen home. He walked her the short way, by the Yules. On his way back, Mr. Link stopped at the crazy gate. Yule, he called. I say Yule. The windows, normally packed with children, were empty. I know every last one of you's in there laying on the floor. Now hear me, Bob Ewell. If I hear one more peep out of my girl Helen about not being able to walk this road, I'll have you in jail before sundown. Mr. Link spat in the dust and walked home. Helen went to work next morning and used the public road. Nobody chunked at her. But when she was a few yards beyond the Yule house, she looked around and saw Mr. Yule walking behind her. She turned and walked on, and Mr. Yule kept the same distance behind her until she reached Mr. Link D's house. All the way to the house, Helen said, she heard a soft voice behind her crooning foul words. 
Thoroughly frightened, she telephoned Mr. Link at a store, which was not too far from the house. As Mr. Link came out of his store, he saw Mr. Yule leaning on the fence. Mr. Yule said, Don't you look at me, Link Dees, like I was dirt. I ain't jumped your... First thing you can do, Yule, is get your stinking carcass off my property. You're leaning on it, and I can't afford fresh paint for it. Second thing you can do is stay away from my cook, or I'll have you up for assault. I ain't touched her, Link Dees, and ain't about to out with no mid nigger. You don't have to touch her. All you have to do is make her afraid. And if assault ain't enough to keep you locked up a while, I'll get you in the ladies' law. So get out of my sight. If you don't think I mean it, just bother that girl again. Mr. Yule evidently thought he meant it, for Helen reported no further trouble. I don't like it, Atticus. I don't like it at all, was Aunt Alexandra's assessment of these events. That man seems to have a permanent running grudge against everybody connected with that case. I know how that kind of are about paying off grudges, but I don't understand why he should harbor one. He had his way in court, didn't he? I think I understand, said Atticus. It might be because he knows in his heart that very few people in Maycomb really believe his and Mayella's yarns. He thought he'd be a hero, but all he got for his pain was, was, okay, we'll convict this Negro, but get back to your dump. He's had his fling with about everybody now, so he ought to be satisfied. He'll settle down when the weather changes. But why should he try to burgle John Taylor's house? He obviously didn't know John was home or he wouldn't have tried. Only lights. John shows on Sunday night or on the front porch and back in the den. Well, you don't know if Bob Yule cut that screen. You don't know who did it, said Atticus. But I can guess. I proved him a liar, but John made him look like a fool. All the time Yule was on the stand, I couldn't dare look at at John and keep a straight face. John looked at him as if he were a three-legged chicken or a square egg. Don't tell me judges don't try to prejudice juries, Atticus chuckled. By the end of October, our lives had become the familiar routine of school, play, study. Jim seemed to have put out of his mind whatever it was he wanted to forget, and our classmates mercifully let us forget our father's eccentricities. Cecil Jacobs asked me one time if Atticus was a radical. When I asked Atticus, Atticus was so amused, I was rather annoyed, but he said he wasn't laughing at me. He said, you tell Cecil I'm as radical as Cotton Tom Heflin. Aunt Alexandra was thriving. Miss Maudie must have silenced the whole missionary society at one blow. Far Auntie again ruled the roost. Her refreshments grew even more delicious. I learned more about the poor Maruna's social life from listening to Mrs. Merriweather. They had so little sense of family that the whole tribe was one big family. A child had as many fathers as there were men in the community and as many mothers as there were women. Jay Grimes Everett was doing his utmost to change this state of affairs and desperately needed our prayers. Makem was itself again, precisely the same as last year and the year before that, with only two minor changes. First, people had removed from their store windows and automobiles the stickers that said, NRA, we do our part. I asked Atticus why, and he said it was because the National Recovery Act was dead. I asked who killed it. He said nine old men. Okay, this NRA is different from the National Rifle Association, obviously. It, uh, it was the National Recovery Act, and it was uh, uh, a piece of legislation that President Roosevelt installed to, um, I think it was Roosevelt, to try and get the country out of the Depression. And the nine old men could only be one thing, the Supreme Court, especially in the 1930s. It was all... You could ask, also add nine old white men. And I might add nine old white Protestant men. 
which the Supreme Court now is more diverse than it ever has been. The second change in Maycomb since last year was not one of national significance. Until then, Halloween in Maycomb was a completely unorganized affair. Each child did what he wanted to do, with assistance from other children if there was anything to be moved, such as placing a light buggy on top of the livery stable. But parents thought things went too far last year when the peace of Miss Tootie and Miss Fruity were shattered. Mrs. Tootie and Fruity, Barber, were maiden lady sisters who lived together in the only Makem residence boasting a cellar. The Barber laders were rumored to be Republicans, having migrated from Clanton, Alabama in 1911. Their ways were strange to us, and why they wanted a cellar, nobody knew, but they wanted one and they dug one, and they spent the rest of their lives chasing generations of children out of it. Now, the cellar that they had was not necessarily one that was under their house, but was like in their backyard or their side yard. Um, we have one up the street from us at a historical house. It's a domed dirt and with a door. And when you open the door, there are steps that take you underground. And that's where, at least in our area, that's where uh, the women kept their canned goods in the winter. Um, it's where you kept your food. It was called a root cellar. Did I? Yeah, root cellar. And potatoes, onions, all kinds of things. After you had harvested them, would go in there. Mrs. Tootie and Fruity, their names were Sarah and Frances, aside from their Yankee ways, were both deaf. Miss Tootie denied it and lived in a world of silence, but Miss Fruity, not about to miss anything, employed an ear trumpet so enormous that Jim declared it was a loudspeaker from one of those dog Victrolas. With these facts in mind and Halloween at hand, some wicked children had waited until the Mrs. Barber were thoroughly asleep, slipped into their living room, nobody but the Radleys locked their house at night, stealthily made way with every stick of furniture therein and hid it in the cellar. I deny having taken part in such a thing. I heard him, was the cry that woke the Mrs. Barber's neighbors at dawn next morning. Heard him drive a truck up to the door, stomped around like horses. They're in New Orleans by now. Miss Tootie was sure those traveling fur sellers who came through the town two days ago had purloined their furniture. Dark they were, Syrians. Mr. Hectate was summoned. He surveyed the area and said he thought it was a local job. Miss Fruity said she know a make em voice anywhere and they were no make em voices. <clears throat> In that parlor last night, rolling their R's all over their premises they were. Nothing less than the bloodhounds must be used to locate their furniture, Miss Tootie insisted. So Mr. Tate was obliged to go 10 miles out, of, out the road, round up the county hounds and put them on the trail. Mr. Tate started them off at the Miss Barber's front steps but all they did was run around to the back of the house and howl at the cellar door. When Mr. Tate set them in motion three times, he finally guessed the truth. By noontime that day, there were not a barefooted child to be seen in Maycomb and nobody took off his shoes until the hounds were returned. So apparently the, whoever stole their furniture was barefooted and left their scent in their footprints which the bloodhounds could pick up. So the next day, all of the children wore shoes. So the Makem ladies said things would be different this year. Too many, those were called the tricks. And at one time, trick or treating was more, um, if you don't give me candy, then I'm going to do something bad to your house. So uh, today, uh, many parents do the kind of thing that they're getting ready to talk about here. So the Makem ladies said things would be different this year. The high school auditorium would be open. There would be a pageant for the grown-ups, apple bobbing, taffy pulling, pinning the tail on the donkey for the children. There would be a prize, 
of 25 cents for the best Halloween costume created by the wearer. So it's like a lot of our fall festivals that we have. Or the trunk and treats, trunk or treats. Jim and I both groaned. Not that we'd ever done anything. It was the principle of the thing. Jim considered himself too old for Halloween anyway. He said he wouldn't be caught anywhere near the high school at something like that. Oh, well, I thought Atticus would take me. I soon learned, however, that my services would be required on stage that evening. Mrs. Grace Merriweather had composed an original pageant entitled Maycomb County Ad Astra Per Aspera, and I was to be a ham. She thought it would be adorable if some of the children were costumed to represent the county's agricultural products. Cecil Jacobs could be dressed up to look like a cow. Agnes Boone would make a lovely butter bean. Another child would be a peanut and on down the line until Mrs. Merriweather's imagination and the supply of children were exhausted. Our only duties, so far as I could gather from our two rehearsals, was to enter from stage left as Mary, Mrs. Merriweather, not only the author but the narrator, identified us when she called out pork that was my cue. Then the assembled company would sing, Make em County, Make em County, we will I be true to thee, as the grand finale, and Mrs. Merriweather would mount the stage with the state flag. My costume was not much of a problem. Mrs. Crenshaw, the local seamstress, had as much imagination as Mrs. Merriweather. Mrs. Crenshaw took some chicken wire and bent it in the shape of a cured ham. Then she covered it with brown cloth and painted it to resemble the original. I could duck under and somebody could pull the contraption down over my head. It came almost to my knees. Mrs. Crenshaw thoughtfully left two peepholes for me. She did a fine job. Jim and I looked exactly like, Jim said I looked exactly like a ham with legs. There were several discomforts though. It was hot. It was a close fit. If my nose itched, I couldn't scratch. And once inside, I could not get out alone. When Halloween came, I assumed that the whole family would be present to watch, my, watch me perform, but I was disappointed. Atticus said as tactfully as he could that he just didn't think he could stand a pageant tonight. He was all in. He'd been in Montgomery, the capital, for a week, and had come home late that afternoon. He thought Jim might escort me if I asked him. Aunt Alexandra said she just had to get to bed early. She'd been decorating that stage all afternoon and was worn out. She stopped short in the middle of her sentence. She closed her mouth, then opened it to say something, but no words came out. What's the matter, Auntie? I asked. Oh, nothing, nothing, she said. Somebody just walked over my grave. She put away from her whatever it was that gave her a pinprick, pinprick of apprehension and suggested that I give the family a preview in the living room. So Jim squeezed me into my costume, stood at the living room door, called out pork, exactly as Mrs. Merriweather would have done, and I marched in. Atticus and Aunt Alexandra were delighted. I repeated my part for Calpurnia in the kitchen and she said I was wonderful. I wanted to go across the street to show Miss Maudie, but Jim said she'd probably be at the pageant anyway. After that, it didn't matter whether they went or not, Jim said he would take me. Thus began our longest journey together. So I'm going to stop here. We do have some hints as to what this next chapter is going to be about. Uh, it's going to take place at the pageant, and as Aunt Alexandra said, she has apprehensions. She has a bad feeling. She can't figure it out, but there's something about it that makes her pause. Um, neither Atticus nor Alexandra are going to be there, but Jim will take her. She uh, can't do anything but walk in this. Her arms are down shut and covered by this ham costume, but she can see out with her eyes. Um, but those are the only hints I'm going to give you.
You'll have to wait to the next chapter to find out what happens. Bye-bye.